What I have in front of you is a spring. I'm going to take a half kilogram mass, I'm going to put it on the spring. I'm going to let it go all the way down, and it is now done my best to make it at rest. This right here then is the rest position or the equilibrium position. If I take this half kilogram mass and I adjust it slightly and let go, the mass is going to enter into simple harmonic motion. We have then on the floor a position sensor. So it's a linear motion sensor. It's sensing the position of the object in simple harmonic motion. When I click start, we're going to see the simple harmonic motion. Do you remember that I said that waves and simple harmonic motion are related? Do you see a wave? Right. It turns out when you plot the position of an object in simple harmonic motion as a function of time, you get a wave. So a lot of the terms for simple harmonic motion and for waves are the same. So we have the position as a function of time. We can also get velocity as a function of time and acceleration as a function of time. So let's zoom in and take a look at what we've got here. So here we have, and we'll kind of, oops, not what I wanted. We'll go here, zoom in, and look at maybe this portion. Let's increase this one a little bit. There we go. So we have position as a function of time, velocity as a function of time, acceleration for as a function of time for this mass spring system in simple harmonic motion. For those of you in calculus, the derivative of position as a function of time is velocity. The derivative of velocity as a function of time is acceleration. acceleration. This is a sine wave. The derivative of sine is cosine. cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative, negative sine. sine. Notice a sine wave, a cosine wave, and a negative sine wave. Right. All the calculus is right there. Right. Now. I do want to talk about, oh, by the way, you don't have to understand that for this class. It's just fun to think about. Okay, so notice that the position as a function of time graph is very smooth. The velocity as a function of time graph is slightly less smooth, and then the acceleration as a function of time graph is clearly <coughs> less smooth. And I want to talk about why that is. So this right here doesn't actually measure velocity or acceleration. All it measures is position. It measures the position and it knows the time at which it measures the position. So how then does it figure out the velocity? All it knows is position. Uh, Carol? The slope on the graph. Give me more. I agree with that. What does that mean? The um, slope of the graph at each point, the derivative of the Right, but we're not going to do it in terms of derivatives. I agree. It is the slope. But going back to the definition of velocity, right? It's displacement over time, delta x over delta t. So it takes two positions, and it knows how long it was between those two positions. And so it can figure out the displacement and divides it by the time. In this particular case, it's taking one data point every, or 50 data points every second. So every, the distance or time between two different positions is 1 50th of a second. So every 50th of a second, it will figure out a new velocity. Um, how does it then figure out the acceleration? Totally. Does it take the two velocity points and then divide by time? Velocity well, or acceleration equals change in velocity over change in time. So it takes two velocity points and creates one acceleration point. So notice that every velocity uses two positions. And how many positions does an acceleration point take? Four. Four. So, there is a certain amount of error in every measurement. In every position measurement, there's a certain amount of error. Relative to how much error there is in a position measurement, how much is there in every velocity measurement? Twice as much. How much error is there in every acceleration versus position? Four times as much. You can see that in the graph. Right. That's why, as you get farther and farther away from the original measurement, the error actually increases. Physically see that. Okay. All right. So let's talk about this curve that you're just looking at. We have the position 
in meters as a function of time in seconds. And it looked something like this. Uh, so we have position as a function of time. This, this piece right here is called a crest. This piece right here is called a trough. What is this distance called right there on our graph? Learn. This is called the amplitude, the maximum displacement from equilibrium position. It is also located right there. So notice amplitude is a similar term between simple harmonic motion and waves. The equilibrium position would be this horizontal line here, and so we get the amplitude. We also have this. What is this called between two crests? Okay. Period. That is called the period. It's the time for one full cycle. This is three, two, one, two, three. So that is the time for one full cycle. That's what you're looking at right there. Now, if instead of having the position or the time on the x-axis, we had the position on the x-axis in meters. What would this have been? It is not something we've actually defined yet in this class, but many of you have seen it before. What would that be? If it's the distance for one full cycle rather than the time for one full cycle at the frequency. It's actually not the frequency. That's uh, just going to be the inverse of the period, which is related to the period, but this, this is something entirely different. So this is the distance travel during one full cycle. Clear? It's the wavelength. So notice, if you change what's on the x-axis, you actually change what you have between the two crests. What, if it's the time, that would be the period, the time for one full cycle. Instead, if you have the, the distance, that is the wavelength. Now, the symbol for wavelength is a lowercase Greek lambda. And wavelength is defined as the distance a wave travels during one full cycle. So let's just take a look at how that compares to the period. The period is the time for one full cycle. So you can see that the period and the wavelength are very related. The, they both have to do with what happens during one full cycle. The period is simply the time. The wavelength is the distance. Now, coming back to simple harmonic motion. Waves and simple harmonic motion are both going to have a period, a time it takes for one full cycle. But when we come in over and look at the simple harmonic motion, this is moving up and down. This does not have a wavelength. So please realize simple harmonic motion does not have a wavelength. So the similarities break down right there. There's a lot that's similar. There is no wavelength for simple harmonic motion. This, is, this isn't traveling anywhere, right? It's just coming back to where it started. So this is not a wave. It's simply simple harmonic motion. It does not have a wavelength. I do want to define period as well. We have one definition as a time for one full cycle. We can defer, define it in terms of wavelengths as well. The period is the time it takes for one wavelength to pass a point. So you can define period in terms of the wavelength. It's the time it takes for one wavelength to pass by a specific point. back to our graph. We have the graph here. We're going to remove velocity and remove acceleration. We're just going to look at position. This right here is one full cycle. So we can actually get the time for one full cycle from this graph. The way we do that is I've highlighted all of the data points that have to do with one full cycle. If I double click on table, it brings up a data table in position, which is all those times. Now, it, it maintains the stuff that I had highlighted in the graph. 
so that we can see that this is the time initial for one full cycle, and this is the time final for one full cycle. So we can actually figure out the period from this. So, for one full cycle, the time initial is 0 0.6417. The time final is equal to, scroll down a little bit, 1.5617 seconds. Therefore, the period is just the difference between the two, 1.5617 minus 0.6417. What is the period of this mass spring system? 0.92. 0.9200 seconds. Chances are good if you look, um, because everything ends in 1.7, so I'm just going to go down to uh, three sig figs, 0.920 seconds. That's the period. We also happen to know that this mass is a half a kilogram. Therefore, with the period and the mass, what can we figure out about this spring? We know the mass, we know the period, we can figure out Benedict what? Uh, uh, I remember a mass spring system doesn't uh, have a yeah, wavelength. Right, so, uh, so it's okay, he's not seeing it. Who, who sees it for me? Danner. We can figure out the spring constant. Using what, Danner? Um, P equals 2 pi square root uh, m over We know the mass. We know the period. We can solve for the spring constant. Please solve this equation, P2, for the spring constant. So we divide both sides by 2 pi. We get the period divided by 2 pi is equal to the square root of m over k. We get the period squared divided by 4 pi squared equals the mass divided by the spring constant. <coughs> Trying to get to the spring constant. He's, he too's not, not seeing it and wants to help him out. What's our next step? Uh, Ricky? We can divide both sides by mass. Okay, we divide both sides by mass. We get the period squared divided by 4 pi squared times m is equal to what? If we divide both sides by mass. What are we left with on the right hand side? James? Uh, 1 over k. 1 over k. Learn. Just raise both sides to the negative one. Take the whole equation to the negative one power. I'll kind of do it in two steps so that we can see it a little bit easier. If we take this whole thing and take the inverse of the entire equation, we can do this and we get 4 pi squared times m divided by the period squared equals the spring constant. Spring constant then is equal to 4 pi squared times 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.92 squared. Spring constant. Uh, 23.321. One. That's plenty. Uh, so spring constant, we'll go with three sig figs, 23.3, what? Pertinent with the dimensions on the spring constant. Not in meters, Manny. Also not in newtons, but if we combine your answers somehow, we will get the right answer. 
object, newtons per meters. We get the spring constant equals 23.3 newtons per meter. So yesterday we did one way where we could figure out the spring constant. Here we have a completely different way of figuring out the spring constant. 